So good morning, everybody. Uh, most of you know me, I'm uh, Syri Gia, and I'm going to present today on the Linden scripting language. So let's just get into it. Our agenda, it's going to be a fairly brief overview. Um, and uh, we will discuss how it's oriented toward event processing. Um, and uh, look at some practical scripts. And incidentally, uh, uh, in real life, I'm Robert Lawson Brown. I'm a physicist. I'm retired. Been from some 47 years in industrial semiconductor processing, various roles. And uh, I got into program, programming because all physicists do. And starting way back in 1969 with Fortran. The Linden scripting language, LSL, is a domain specific scripting language. And by that I mean that it doesn't really have much use outside of the environment of Second Life and OpenSIM. But its purpose is to provide interactivity with things like vehicles and controls and non playing characters and providing conveniences such as teleports. Um, here's an example. This is a little vehicle, and I uh, put a copy of it over next to the presentation screen. And uh, like most vehicles, it has a little sit pad. That's the one that has been highlighted in the editing mode. And you can bring up the editing panel that you see here. Uh, all objects are made up of prims and meshes. meshes uh, and each one of a, a prim or a mesh uh, has properties. And there are general properties, uh, physical properties such as position and size, uh, various features that are set. Uh, the textures that give it its visu visual look, and some contents. And the contents can include things like animations, sounds, uh, pictures, textures, and so forth, and scripts that can be used to provide interactivity for them. And here's a little script that's inside the uh, vehicle. And this is actually the sitting script. So you can see it has the sitting position and uh, 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 you can see here is I have to scroll through it, but uh, responses to uh, various controls that will move the vehicle around. Here's another example. This is a door. And the door has a script that opens and closes it upon uh, being touched. Also plays a little sound and uh, uh, provides a, a smooth uh, motion. That particular door, by the way, is an airlock door. So it's paired with another door, an inner and an outer door. And there's a safety interlock so that you can't open both doors simultaneously. As you would want, as you would not want to do with a uh, actual airlock. Okay, so how does LSL relate to general computer programming? Because it is quite different. And as I will go over here, it is implementing an event-driven execution in an imperative structure. So just for a couple slides, let's look at computer programs in general. So very briefly, any program is a set of instructions uh, that is known as code. And uh, computers execute code to perform specific tasks. The language for this is uh, very specialized and somewhat arcane. Um, you know, and I've used quite a few over the decades. Uh, currently the biggies are Python, Java, and JavaScript. Also, uh, programs are just not code by themselves. You also have to have data that the code will be working upon. Um, so you need the step-by-step -step instructions. You also need the data that is going to be used. 
we have uh, two general categories, the procedural and uh, event driven. Now a procedural program goes step by step to manipulate data, generate a product or media. Whereas the event driven is waiting for something to happen to which the program will respond. And uh, the programs that run your uh, iPhone or smartphone and uh, tablets and so forth are very much event driven. And they're simply idling there, just waiting for you to press a key, something like 95% of the time. For procedural programming, when people uh, learn a new language, the very first thing they do is to write a program that says, hello world. So I just threw a couple of snippets in here uh, to uh, show you how that is being done. Um, and uh, one is written in the uh, Swift language, uh, which is printing the Hello World five times. And then I show a similar snippet uh, in LSL, uh, which instead of a print has uh, owner say, uh, which basically puts Hello World into the uh, chat line for the owner to hear. And an event driven program or event oriented if you prefer you register an event such as i uh, first tell it that i want the script to listen and i want it to listen in, in the example i show here specifically for the owner then i have an event handler and the event handler when triggered will execute a small amount of code and in this case it says that when you uh, hear something which they refer to as a listen event it will say back to the owner, hello world. Now, the important thing is that this only does so when the event happens. It uh, does not take place in any given sequence. And that is going to be the uh, most uh, important part of working with LSL. Uh, just real briefly, there are other coding styles that uh, people will talk about. I won't go through this really, just wanted to throw it up so that you'll, you'll know that there are different ways you can write your uh, statements in code. Uh, but in particular, we're interested in the imperative form because in the Linden scripting language, uh, while we're event oriented, uh, the events tend to trigger uh, imperatives. Uh, we also use functions where possible to uh, help encapsulate and reuse code. I should also mention that I can put multiple scripts into uh, one object. And that kind of lets me pretend that I'm doing object-oriented code. Uh, but that can be uh, somewhat argued. So let's look at the code organization now. Uh, all of the LSL is organized into blocks. Uh, the block is inside curly brackets. And each block has a header that indicates the type of block. And the example I show here is a state block. So I say there's a state, it has some name, and then there are the curly brackets that will contain its code. The types of blocks, we have function blocks, which are executed by invoking a function. State blocks, which are executed by switching to different states event blocks, which are triggered when an event occurs, and then control blocks, uh, if then type statements, logical statements that control the flow of uh, the program. Let's go through these. For functions, these are reusable blocks of code. Um, we generally do that at the top level of the program. And I will get to explaining types shortly, but uh, you do have to say what type of a function uh, you're going to uh, declare. Uh, for example, here I have a function that's going to return a vector value. So I say vector, I give it a name, my function. I give it a list of uh, parameters that are going to be passed into that function. And then in my curly brackets, I have the code for that function. And in this case, it's returning a, a, a vector uh, from the function. There are 481 predefined functions in LSL. Uh, 
uh, and I can only put a tiny fraction of those on the one slide here. Uh, but there is a handy reference online in the LSL wiki for looking all of these up. And uh, they all handle things like uh, uh, changing prim properties and uh, scanning the environment or, uh, you know, working with other events. Um, you know, so you can uh, take a look at those. States. Okay, now a state is something uh, you won't find often in other languages. There's a few that use states. But uh, states organize the code into blocks that have distinct behaviors. Uh, you know, occasionally, or not occasionally, actually all the time, you're going to want to handle events in different ways, depending upon what your uh, script is currently doing. So we declare state blocks after the functions. And a state block will have event detectors and the event handlers. Uh, under the control of the program, uh, it will shift from one state to another. Uh, by the way, there is one state called the default state, which is mandatory, and that's a state you always start in. Events, uh, you know, are things that uh, happen externally and are detected by the uh, script. Um, and you have each event handler declared inside of a state block. Um, now, each event has to be registered. And the reason is that you don't want the uh, server, the simulation server, to be throwing every event that happens around you at your script. Uh, you only want to queue those up for the script to handle that are important. Uh, so you can turn awareness of certain events on and off. And again, uh, the important part of uh, LSL is its event awareness for objects being touched, uh, objects uh, being sensed nearby, messages being heard, information received from an external server, and several other types of uh, events. Okay, And I will show a little clearer what a state is when we get uh, looking at some of the code. There are 38 different events, and I've listed them here. Um, you know, and uh, you can see what they are. Uh, we have ones that are at target. That uh, means I was moving and I got to my destination. I have changed that indicates uh, something was changed on the object. Uh, uh, we have collisions between objects and so forth, uh, many types. Now, this whole event thing means that the scripts can be a little tricky to uh, build. And that's because events can invoke different parts of the program in any order. You don't have any control over that. You know, if you've set it up to have touches and listens and that sort of thing, you don't know when someone is going to chat, it, chat something that the program hears or touches the object, or a message comes in from an outside server and other such things. Um, and like I say, LSA is uh, unique in that it has this event awareness uh, built in. So uh, I refer to registering an event. That's where you use a built-in function to uh, uh, filter events, to uh, not have them uh, overwhelm the script. Uh, when an event happens, the simulation server checks to see if a script has registered that event and the event matches the filter. It matches the event details are placed in a queue for the script. The script pulls the queue and pulls events on a first in, first out basis. Uh, so for example, let's say that uh, uh, you are looking at events where both uh, you're looking at touching and scanning, uh, scanning for nearby objects. Well, if someone uh, touches, that will be handled first, and then if uh, the scanner picks something up, that'd be handled next. Uh, the queue can only hold 64 events. If more events happen than that before the script can handle them, it simply discards the more recent events. 
so it is possible to overload a script and have it start ignoring people. There are some special events that are not queued. For example, when I change the state of a script, I have state entry and state exit. Those are handled immediately. There's also an event for resing an object. And if you res an object, that event is handled Im immediately. We also have touch collision and money transactions that are not filtered. Uh, the script is always aware of those. They are queued though. You know, so if <laughs> people try to give you money too fast, you'll miss the more recent ones. Uh, most of the event registrations, such as sensor and listen, are cleared when you change the state of the script. Uh, there is an exception to that, the timer event. Each script has only one timer running. And that, by the way, is a good reason for putting different parts of your uh, uh, behavior into different scripts, because then you can have different timers for each one. Then we have control flow in blocks. Well, these are things that uh, take some sort of a logical test before they execute uh, the code. So you have, for example, if something equals something else, then you do this. And we also have controls like while this is true, do that. There are seven types of uh, control flow. I mentioned state and state is a block that says you leave the current block of code and you start up a whole different block of code under this new state name. Uh, now, when you use state to shift control, just being a little pedantic here, it's an imperative statement, but don't worry about that too much. Um, it doesn't have any curly brackets with it. It's an event, but it doesn't have any curly brackets. Uh, do while. That means you do the associated block of code, then you check a condition. So it's going to execute that code at least once, and then it will see if it wants to continue executing it over and over again. While is the opposite way. It first checks the condition, and if that condition is OK, then it does the associated block. And it will do it over and over again, so long as the condition is, is true. Uh, far is a loop. So I might, for example, set up an index, and, uh, you know, say index equals five, and I decrement it each time I do the uh, block. So I'll execute it five times. You may remember that uh, when I showed the hello world part, uh, I had a, a for loop that uh, said to the owner, hello world, five times. Inside a block, I can put a return statement, and when the return statement uh, is encountered, it will exit that block and go to the next highest block above it. And that will become clearer when I uh, show some code snippets. And then finally, I have jump. You know, you can label lines of code, and jump says go immediately to that line of code. I don't recommend using jump. Uh, jump is something that uh, has persisted in programming languages ever since the days of uh, the basic programming language. Uh, some 50 years ago, and it causes uh, spaghetti code. So uh, we tend to uh, say, please don't use jumps. And as uh, Mike Shaw has mentioned, uh, it is all called the go to in some languages. Uh, control blocks can be inside event handler blocks, and they can be inside function blocks. Uh, with one exception, and that's that uh, state flow control. Uh, that cannot be outside of an event handler. It always has to be inside an event handler. Can't be in a function. And uh, I find that unfortunate. Uh, I've seen many occasions where it would be nice to have uh, state control inside a function, but it's just forbidden. You, you cannot do that. So, State blocks have event handlers. Event handler blocks have imperatives. And that is the most important structure you will see in a uh, LSA program. Um, the code shifts over one or more states. Each state has its own event handlers. 
and each event handler has its own code to execute that task. And here's an example. I have a state that is named the dogs are out. That declares a state. Then in its curly brackets, I have an event. I have the state entry event. And that declares an event handler to operate when you enter the state. And then in that curly brackets, I have a, an imperative. I say, I say, who let the dogs out? And that's ex executable code. And then immediately after that, I say, state who, who, who. And that is telling the program to leave this state and go to the next state. OK. Uh, variables. When you need variables to hold information, and variables have a label and a type. Variables may be declared in any block or at the top level. Uh, when you declare a variable, you give it that type that allocates a certain amount of memory for the variable. The types are integers, floating point numbers, strings of characters, strings of text, uh, keys, which I will explain, uh, vectors, which is basically a set of three floating point numbers, rotation, which is basically a set of four floating point numbers, and the list. So here's my example. Uh, I declare an integer, something we count, that's going to be its name, and I initialize it to be 256. The type is strict. You cannot change it once you declare it. And the uh, script editor will yell at you if you, uh, if you try to do that. Uh, but you can do a type conversion when you change the value and use it in another variable. For example, here I'm showing I have an integer, count the daisies, which I initialize. Then I have a string, how many daisies, which is going to be text. Well, to turn the integer value, count the daisies, into a string, I use the uh, uh, type in parentheses just in front of the uh, variable name. And that will fetch the value, turn it into a string, and then put that value into my other variable. OK, I mentioned variables go inside blocks. You do have global and local variables. If I put a variable at the top of the program, it is visible to all blocks. But if I put a variable inside a block, say an event block or a function block, that variable is only usable inside that block or any blocks contained within that block. Uh, it cannot be used in a block that's at a higher level. Uh, this is called scope, by the way. You'll hear that in a lot of programming languages comes from the Greek, and it simply means look at. Another thing to be aware of is that variable can be used only after being declared. So in looking at my program from top to bottom, if I uh, try to use a variable name that I haven't declared yet, it will fail. Uh, so you uh, have to be aware of that. Other languages have what we call a look ahead function. Uh, for example, JavaScript looks ahead. So I can declare variables anywhere and it will, it will catch it. But uh, that is not the case in uh, LSL. So declare most variables at the top of the block and you'll be fine. Uh, also, I recommend using global variables uh, sparingly. You want to use your global variables when you really need to pass values from uh, one state to another. List, well, some people wouldn't call list a variable. Uh, I did here. But basically, it's a collection of values. So it's an ordered set of any values. And note, this is the values, not the variables. You use variables to put a value into a list. But once it's in the list, it's no longer a variable. It's, a, it's an actual solid concrete value. And that's the only data collection that's available in LSL. And boy, does that ever cause misery. Everybody wants better data collections in LSL. We don't have them. Uh, your list looks like this. Uh, it's a square bracket and then the, each item separated by a comma. The items can be integers and floats and vectors, strings and rotations. 
but not another list. You cannot nest a list into list. Now, I'm not going to discuss the uh, syntax in detail because that would take hours and hours and hours, but I am going to show a practical program and point out some features. For deep learning, you want to go to the LSL wiki, and I uh, show the link here. Uh, you can also find it by simply searching for it. Just search for LSL portal, and it will come right up. Uh, and uh, uh, you'll find, you know, a very large amount, overwhelming amount of information there on uh, programming an LSL. Um, so let's look at a practical program. First, let's look at the skeleton of the program. Um, you can see at the top, I start by doing a global variable. So I give it a type, I give it a name, and I optionally give it some initial, initial value. And then I declare my function blocks. So again, I have an optional type. I give the function a name and a list of parameters. Then it's code in the uh, curly brackets, it's code block. Then I have a state block. Give the state a name, curly brackets, and then I have my code inside the curly brackets for the state. And typically there will be an event handler and it will have curly brackets showing its code. Okay. So here's a little uh, example. I'll start at the top of the program with an integer that says, are the dogs out equal to true. Now, I didn't mention Booleans, in uh, LSL, you can have Boolean values of true and false, but they're actually just integers. True is anything that is not zero. False is zero. Uh, so I created my little Boolean here, are the dogs out, which can be either true or false, but it's actually an integer. It can be some, any integer at all. The next I had a, flo a floating point value that is a velocity. Um, And uh, I set that to an initial value. Then after that, I declare a function. Well, this function is going to return a floating value. I give it a name, how far, and it takes one parameter, a floating point variable that is the time away. Then inside that function, I have my float is a distance. And I say, if the dogs are out, if that's true, then I calculate the distance as the uh, time of way times the velocity. And then I return that distance. My distance is a floating value, so that's uh, the correct value I should return from this function. Going on, uh, I repeated what I just showed you here, a little bit smaller type. I come down, I have my first state, the default state have an event handler for the state entry, and then I have a uh, registering an event for listening. When the listen event occurs, that's the event handler that's shown just beneath that, if the message is bark bark, then I change the uh, are the dogs out value to be true, because I heard bark bark, they are obviously out. Then I jump to the state, bring them home. Okay, so I have left the default state. I come to this state, bring them home. It's another state. I have a state entry for it. And uh, <clears throat> I tell the owner how far he's going to have to go to find the dogs. And then I set up a sensor that looks for the dogs. Okay, and uh, if the sensor detects a dog, it will uh, tell the owner how many detected, and then it jumps right back to the default state. Okay. Now, I mentioned that it was wise to uh, divide operation up into several short scripts whenever feasible. I know there's something going on in the chat here. Let me just uh, check here. Okay, yeah. Uh, 
so, yeah, I see they're giving you some resources for uh, scripting. Uh, so I'm going to show you now uh, a multiple script case. And let me just uh, click up here. There we go. This is my uh, NPC controller and communicator. It's uh, several scripts that work in concert. Um, and uh, you may recall when I was showing you the contents of uh, objects uh, that there could be uh, more than one script in there, more than one content. Um, so I have an object that is my NPC controller. If you've noticed to the right of the presentation screen, that's the little box that's sitting there. And that's used to control NPCs. And I have two NPCs currently uh, resed here in the uh, presentation area. I have the Avenger off to the right, and then I have Dancing Pamela uh, sort of behind me on the left. Okay, and here you can see uh, what's inside them. Um, in the Avenger, you can see that I have uh, three different scripts uh, and a number of animations that she can use. Uh, over in Charlie, I have a similar setup uh, for him. And then in the controller, you can see I have two scripts, a communication script and a dialogue script. Now, this is going to be complicated, but I'm going to skim through it, just get the feel of it. And, uh, you know, I am available if anyone wants to uh, have a one-to-one uh, -one hands-on tutorial on scripting. So let's look at the control station script first. This script talks to the NPCs and to a user interface. Okay, so like before, you can see I declare some global variables at the top. Uh, then I have a function called setup control. Uh, notice this function does not return a value, so I did not have to give it a type. Uh, but it sets up an event handler for me. Then I have my default state. It's always appears first, so I don't have to declare it like other states. And upon entry, it will do a setup, uh, do the setup com uh, function. On res, it resets the scripts, so it will re-enter the default uh, uh, state uh, whenever it is res. By the way, um, states are kind of like properties of a, of a prim or a mesh. Uh, they will persist. Uh, over server restarts, if you take it in inventory and then re-res it and that kind of thing. So if you really want to make sure that you always start from the same spot, you need to use the on res event to uh, reset the script back to default or do other kinds of initializations if you think you need it. Okay. Uh, when the listen event occurs, well, here's the handler for it. And uh, you can see that it checks the message, makes sure it's the kind of message it wants to handle. If it is the right kind of message, it executes a function called message linked. And I mentioned that I was doing this with multiple scripts. Well, here's the key to that. Message linked sends that message onto other scripts inside the same object. Doesn't send it out over. Uh, into the outside environment, keeps it nicely uh, encapsulated inside the object. Um, and uh, if I receive a message that looks like it was intended for a NPC, then I broadcast that one out to the NPCs, which of course are other objects. They're, they're not contained in the control station. And here is the NPC communication script. This is the one that would be waiting for those uh, messages coming from the control station. And uh, I will not uh, 
you know, take a lot of time explaining this one, just let you see the way it is set up. Um, as you can see, I just recently uh, modified this one back in uh, February. That's, by the way, is a good practice. At the top, I always have a series of comments where I give the name of the script, what it's supposed to do, um, who did it, who wrote it, and the version. Okay. Uh, here's a function that says handle instructions. So it gets an instruction, and it just basically goes through and sees what the instruction is and then does something. Okay. And uh, again, I won't go through all of this. Uh, I'm happy to share it with anyone who wants to uh, go through it and have a look at it. Um, <clears throat> I get linked messages from the different behavior scripts and uh, it will look at those messages and see how those have to be handled. And some of them might be passed along to the control station. So the control If an NPC cannot communicate with its uh, control station, it will attempt to find a new one. If it can't find a new one, then it dereses. And I do that so that I don't have any rogue NPCs running around. Uh, you know, if they happen to stumble out of the parcel or uh, region where I wanted them to be, uh, they will dereses and not cause any trouble. All right, now, when writing and debugging, the one thing you have to get used to is that, uh, well, first of all, you know, you're going to go plan the algorithm as best you can and make the code, but it's going to fail the first time, the second time, uh, maybe more times after that. Got to fix it and try again. Uh, and a hardware example of that was the uh, test of the uh, heavy launch in the Starship vehicle uh, on Thursday, <laughs> which had a failure, and they're going to fix it and try again in a couple months. So I'll uh, pause here for a moment and see if there's uh, any questions. Anybody want to uh, jump in and chat? Okay, uh, there are some differences with OpenSim. Uh, first off, OpenSyn has a few more functions than uh, Second Life does. Some fairly useful ones at that. Uh, also, there is what we call uh, experience permissions. For example, if I set up a kind of touch teleport, your avatar has to have given permission to be teleported. Uh, and that is saved uh, in each uh, parcel. They don't do that in OpenSim. They use a different mechanism altogether, uh, which they call uh, the uh, damage uh, control uh, setup. 
Um, so, you know, there are some differences. Um, however, most of what you do is transferable uh, between the uh, two different kinds of uh, systems, OpenSim and Second Life. Uh, there might be more divergence in the future. Um, you know, you may have heard that the uh, Second Life viewer and the OpenSim viewer have uh, completely branched. You can't use one with the other. So there's two versions of Firestorm. There's a Firestorm for Second Life and a Firestorm for OpenSim. And uh, I suppose there were some reasons they needed to do that, but, uh, uh, you know, it is kind of unfortunate. Um, let's see any other questions here. Okay, uh, I'm going to move on to some additional material then, unless someone wants to leap in. Oh, wait, uh, did Roy ask something? Um, yeah, uh, that's true. Uh, note cards cannot be used as data storage in uh, Second Life. Uh, the only way to have a real data storage in Second Life is to use an external server. Uh, for example, I have a uh, server on Google Virtual Machines that's uh, actually called Sayagia.org uh, that I can use as an external database. And uh, inside of Second Life in a script, I have the ability to send an HTTP request to it and get an HTTP response back. Uh, so that provides a, a method of having a, a much larger data store than uh, is possible in Second Life. Um, <clears throat> okay, let's see what else we have here. A little bit about the LSL syntax, and this may be redundant, but uh, oh, download LSL. Uh, well, it, it's built into uh, Second Life, so you don't really download it. And also, you don't really have any uh, decent external editors for it. You have to edit it in Second Life, in a script, in an object, to really be able to edit and test and do a programming cycle. Uh, and that is very unfortunate. Uh, however, there is that wiki we mentioned that provides uh, all the information on the uh, syntax and a huge number of examples. Uh, by the way, that's something else. You know, I found that uh, generally in uh, Second Life, if you're thinking about a script to do something, there's a very good chance that someone has already done it. And you simply have to search for it, you'll find it, and uh, you can probably use it with a little bit of modification. Let's see here. <clears throat> Okay, I mentioned that variables have specific types. An integer is a whole number between the limits shown here on the screen. And for those of you who are into this, it is assigned 32-bit value. And besides using uh, uh, integer uh, notation, uh, you can also use hexadecimal notation uh, uh, for integer values. Um, Floats are numbers with a fractional part. Uh, it supports uh, exponential notation, and uh, it can be either positive or negative. So it can go down to uh, values smaller than are physically real and to values that uh, are larger than you could ever expect to require. Of course, the real point of floating point is to get extra precision in, uh, uh, you know, in value. Okay, um, strings are text. And the text is, the, is a sequence of 16-bit characters using Unicode. So any 16-bit Unicode character, including the uh, uh, little graphic ones, uh, can be used. The total length is limited only by the available memory and uh, in LSL, they are always inside double quotes.
Uh, let's say someone's talking about uh, resin prints and so forth. Uh, yeah, because you see, when you do some things, the script will go to sleep for a, a few fractions of a second. Um, and uh, that basically uh, prevents it from uh, doing too much at once. Um, Uh, keys. Now, I mentioned keys before. Every object uh, in Second Life, in your inventory or resed out in the open or whatever, has a unique key. And it's a sequence of hexadecimal characters grouped uh, in a manner that follows a standard, the UUID-4 standard. And I show an example of what a key looks like uh, there. They're all unique. You duplicate something, the duplicate will have its unique key, and they are automatically assigned when you create an object. Uh, there is a huge number of possible keys, uh, so again, there's no great fear of them ever running out of keys. Vectors, well, as I said, a vector is an ordered set of three values in the float format. Uh, now, a vector can be a position, it can be a Orlean rotation, it can be a color, like, you know, uh, red, green, and blue values. Uh, it can be a velocity. You know, it's simply three floating point numbers, lots of different uses. And in the code, we put the values uh, between uh, the little angular brackets. Uh, so if I was using variable names, it would be an angle bracket, X comma Y comma Z. Um, and uh, <laughs> a tall story. Uh, no, not a tall story. It's a real story. Um, <clears throat> or you can put in the, the actual values directly into a vector and so forth. And, you know, the names don't have to be X, Y, Z. They could be Bob, Ted, Alice, you know, and so on. Uh, Typically, you would have a variable name and you set it equal to a vector. Once I've done that, there's a special notation for getting the values out. I can go uh, uh, with the dot uh, syntax you see here. So I created wombat as a sequence of three values. And I go wombat.x, I get the x value, wombat.y, I get the y value, and so on. Um, <clears throat> Okay, let's see here. <clears throat> a rotation is a ordered set of four values in float format, and it is called a, a quantarian. Now, I tell you, you know, uh, in all my years of, of uh, going to uh, presentations on physics, no one has ever successfully drawn the quantarian uh, rotations on a, a blackboard. And I do mean blackboard because that ages me. That I came from the blackboard era, not the whiteboard era. But, uh, you know, whenever you try, you just end up getting confused. You know. Uh, uh, however, the Orlean rotations are a bit easier to understand, although not quite as useful in terms of uh, combining rotations of the quantarian. So LSL provides a way to translate between the quantarian and the Orlean uh, and back again. So generally, if you want to multiply rotations, uh, combine them, uh, you do it in the quantarian format. Uh, if you want to know what it is and, and uh, be able to visualize it, you turn it into the Orlean format. Okay. The list I mentioned was an ordered set of any values. And uh, I mentioned my irritation at the fact that you're so limited, uh, but it is as it is. Variables are basically labeled memory. And that's the reason the typing is so strict, because once it sets out the amount of memory required for a given variable, you're stuck with it. 
Um, so that's why we have to declare them. And here I just show some more examples, you know, integer pi slices, float pi diameter, a list of pies. You notice that I'm able to uh, combine different types of variables into the list. And the static typing, you know, that you uh, can change the value, but the type has to stay the same. Uh, that means that list handling is not very efficient in uh, LSL. It does slow down execution, uh, consumes more memory than, uh, uh, you know, the individual variables would. Uh, and it will cause runtime crashes uh, if you uh, overload, uh, make them too long. Scope I mentioned before. Scope is where a variable can be used. Uh, if I make the variable declare a condition outside of any state or function, it's global. It can be used anywhere. But if I put it inside a state, it can only be used by the code inside that state, inside a function, only inside the function, and so forth. Um, <clears throat> mentioned events, uh, registering them. And, uh, you know, you need to know that the program will wait, and wait, and wait until the event occurs. And then it will execute whatever was in the uh, handler. Okay, so uh, that's what I prepared to talk about. So uh, again, let's see if there's some questions. We have uh, about eight minutes to go before the uh, end of the hour. So uh, anybody want to uh, talk about some items? Um, or ask about the NPCs I've set up or uh, whatever. Uh, yes, the slides will be available, uh, and in fact, I did record this session, so I'm going to try to make a little video of it that uh, I will uh, put onto uh, the Second Life, uh, uh, sorry, the Science Circle, the Science Circle YouTube channel, so I'll be there. Uh, yes, the uh, NPCs are Animesh, and the scripts are triggered in animation. Um, I know you can't see what I see, but I'm going to click on the uh, control station, and I'm going to uh, control the Avenger uh, and change your animation. So if you watch, the animation should now change. Okay, she's now doing a faster walk. And now she's doing her sneaky walk and her slow walk and so forth. Uh, I also have Pathfinder enabled on uh, these NPCs, but as I mentioned earlier, uh, Pathfinding uh, doesn't seem to be functioning uh, in, the, uh, in this particular uh, parcel. Okay. <clears throat> and uh, yeah, I you know I'll share my MPC codes and control station and so forth with anybody. You know, uh, oh pathfinding. Well, pathfinding is a uh, Second Life only innovation. Basically, it lets an object choose a designation and then choose the best path around all the objects that might be in its way. And then it moves smoothly to that destination. Um, unfortunately, it's a somewhat buggy. It, it, it doesn't seem to quite work right all the time. Uh, for example, I can tell a, a pathfinding uh, object to stay within a parcel, but occasionally it will try to escape the parcel and get into trouble. Um, 
and I hope that one day uh, there's some improvements to pathfinding. Uh, but I have a feeling that Linden Labs uh, resources are being put in other directions at the moment. Uh, so, you know, it is as it is. There are other ways to uh, make movement. There is a terrific set of functions called key framing. And in key framing, uh, you uh, set up a list of where you would uh, like an object to be or, or uh, rotate or whatever and uh, the timing part and it will move from one to the next uh, quite smoothly. Now it differs from pathfinding in that pathfinding will keep the object from making any collisions and uh, has some other nice little attributes. In keyframing, no such uh, luck. If you set up a path in keyframing that collides with something else, it's going to collide. Uh, pathfinding has lots of nifty things. It uh, can be set up to avoid. So you can set up a character, and if you get too close to it, the character moves away from you. And you can set them to follow, so it will pursue you, you know, a, a short distance away. And then you have uh, patrols where it will go from point to point. Someone puts an object in the way, it will figure out how to get around it. Uh, and then, of course, uh, just wandering uh, a random walk. So I really wish that pathfinding was more universal and uh, worked uh, somewhat better. And we can but hope for the future. Okay, uh, more questions? Okay, we have about a minute to go. Um, and I'm kind of talked out. <laughs> so, uh, oh, the recordings. I usually get them up on the weekend. Um, you know, we'll see how quickly I can go this weekend because this uh, is Earth Day weekend uh, here in my area. And there are some activities that I'm going out to. You know uh, myself, so uh, I'll be out there. Uh, yes, and uh, uh, you know I think these NPCs uh, are going to be very useful as information givers and uh, uh, you know uh, other things. You can, the animations are all done with what is called the uh, BioVision hierarchy. It's a long in use. Uh, text-based animation system. Uh, so you can get your, your NPCs to do anything. You know, uh, walk to the well, put a bucket down the well, pull the water up, walk away, that kind of thing. You know, it just takes a bit of work to, uh, to handle that. Okay, so that's our hour. And I guess we will close up shop now. Um, and I do hope you did enjoy the presentation.